new from the north, a, a new kind of, well, not new, but a kind of global connection, I would say. This is Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And we're going to talk to Dr. Ken Rogers about uh, free trade, free trade agreements uh, between the U.S. and Canada and and uh, in other places, too. We're going to find out how that works, and how relevant it is today in a, in a fragmented world. Uh, we'll be right back to do that. Welcome to the show, Ken. I'm so interested in this topic because I found when I looked it up that I really hadn't remembered and maybe I never really knew too much about free trade agreements. And I want to know that now. Thank you for joining us today. Well, they call them free trade agreements, but there really is no such thing as free trade. Okay. Uh, we, yeah. we might have thought that in free trade, like with two you know, friendly countries like the U.S. and Canada, um, there would be no tariffs. There would be no limitation on import-export. Uh, there would be free investment. And there would be um, a kind of um, uh, easy way to resolve disputes. That's what we would have expected between these two countries. Are you telling me we're not getting that? Well, we have a trade agreement. No, but that, that's quite different than free trade. Uh, you know, in um, economic theory, the very first course that any person takes in, at university in economics would, would uh, explain why free trade is a good thing. You know, basically you have um, uh, two kinds of advantages. And let's just pretend you're, you're comparing the United States and Africa. You know, and the United States has a, um, a comparative advantage and an absolute advantage in almost everything. You know, but, but let's just, you know, pretend that, um, you know, you have two products you can make, uh, uh, cans of vegetables, or you can make cans of fruit, you know, and so can the person in Africa. Well, if you, if you simplified it down to where, you know, the whole country or whatever was exhibited by one person, if one person could, in a day, make 100 cans of, of either in the U.S., make 100 cans of fruit or 100 cans of vegetables, so that's their productive capacity or their ability to generate. Um, where in Africa, uh, let's say that the the fellow or the um, country, whatever it is, it could only do, uh, say, 80 cans of fruit, where the U.S. does 100. That, that gives them an, the U.S. an absolute advantage. No, but the African can only do, let's say, 40 uh, cans of vegetables, you know, so that in the African scenario, the one day's worth of work, uh, you know, there's a difference in what they can produce. And, and that's your sort of comparative advantage, is their comparative advantage is to, to make more fruit. Well, the economics thing, and you got to, you know, have a whole bunch of numbers and it takes, uh, you know, inter, you know, first year uh, college students, uh, you know, a course or two to grasp the idea. But essentially, um, the it's to the advantage of both countries to have trade, even though you'd say, well, what could the U.S. gain? Well, the U.S. guy has a choice. He has to do either fruit or vegetables, and so does the African. Well, the African, if they produce more fruit, they can actually trade some fruit to the U.S. for some U.S. vegetables, and both countries would get more than what they could themselves produce in a single day. You know, so it's it's really... Free trade is a wonderful theoretical concept. It just doesn't really happen too much. Now, the, the first commodity everybody deals with it, when you're talking trade, and certainly between Canada and the United States, it's a pretty significant portion, is, is uh, you know, food or agricultural products. Well, the 
Canada and the U.S. differ uh, greatly in how they handle agricultural subsidies, you know, things that screw up free trade. You know, the, for example, in Canada, one of the items that in the la when the U.S. Uh, Canada free or trade agreement was being negotiated, one of uh, Donald Trump's big complaints, and it certainly arose from the state of Wisconsin, had to do with um, uh, all of Canada has uh, what they call supply management, uh, and that's the Canadian government's. Um, intervention in, uh, you know, dairy and, um, you know, eggs and poultry, uh, where the United States intervenes in those things with humongous dollar subsidies in different forms. So the U.S. subsidizes the farmer and so that the farmer uh, with those subsidies ends up where the price of the milk that uh, is produced in Wisconsin is at a lower price than it otherwise would be. Where in Canada, the supply management uh, for the a design for exactly the same purpose as the American one, like you got to get the purpose of, of why there's agricultural subsidies is, is the poor farmer, if the weather is good, he has a bumper crop, but so does everybody else. So therefore, he gets diddly squat in value for his produce. On the other hand, uh, you know, there's suddenly a, a floods and or some other reason, and uh, and the crops are not good. So that the price is really high, but the poor farmer he doesn't have anything uh, produced. So that uh, you know, really the. And who would want to be in a far, in a farmer? Well, because food happens to be an important item, uh, everybody has to eat. And governments uh, find uh, that it's useful to um, encourage enough uh, supply of food so everybody can eat. So Canada gets one method of government intervention in, you know, the uh, dairy product, like for example, milk. You know, a gallon of milk in in where I live costs about four and a half dollars. Uh, but if I went a hundred miles south uh, into Washington State, I could buy that same gallon of milk for less than two bucks. You know, like the the U.S. system ends up with a, a subsidized price to the consumer. If you ignore the fact that the consumer gave the money to the government, who in turn subsidized the farmer, you know, in Canada it's just a different route. Well, what's uh, what's the result in terms of trade, um, <clears throat> and how it affects uh, the farmers on both sides of of the equation? Well, be, you know, in the um, the trade agreement between Canada and the U.S. Uh, uh, the the items that are covered by Canada's supply management agreement, uh, there is no um, uh, trade of those items. You know, so it's not a, a trade of of all things. And and every country in the world has subsidies or intervention of some sort in their um, trade policies. Um, well, you know, and, ask and, you, would it be better, Ken? If, if they, in, in this case, uh, Canada and, and the U.S. had precisely the same kinds of support for farmers, um, that is, if the U.S. adopted, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the production management and or in the alternative, uh, Canada adopted uh, price supports. Well, um, I don't know that it makes an awful lot of difference. I mean, it's really... Um, you know, free trade is a good economic concept, but just because something is good economic, makes good economic sense, doesn't mean that you should do it. You know, that is, the United States is uh, is a large country that can produce almost anything, and why should they not be self-sufficient in food? You know, it's a... It, like Hawaii has a 
location has a problem. It, it's not self-sufficient in anything. <laughs> That's true. You know, <laughs> and and so you know you're always um, at risk. You're 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 getting doodled by somebody. Like like every country cheats on trade. You know, I'll use the word cheat. You know, because it's kind of simple concept. If you think of a single family home, like your family or my family, how can we improve our lot? Well, we would like to provide goods or services to other people that they will buy for more money than we will buy from them. You know, that is... I, I want a trade surplus. My goods and services, I would like to sell you more than I want to buy from you. Well, everybody can't do that. Yep. You know, you have countries in the world that have have consistently had had I'll have to let that phone ring, but it's it's a landline, so I can't shut it off. <laughs> What about, um, what about tariffs? Um, you know, because tariff is kind of another way of uh, imposing an advantage on one side and a disadvantage on the other side. I mean, that could be sort of a natural process in the market, as you described, but it could also be a governmental action that imposes a tariff. And um, my, my understanding is that if you have free trade, you don't have tariffs. On the other hand, Trump uh, Trump's efforts to uh, impose tariffs on the Chinese, which is sounded really political, uh, uh, kind of backfired, and it's still in place. Could you talk about tariffs and how they relate to free trade? Well, uh, tariff is is one of the many methods by which uh, governments uh, uh, do not favor free trade. I mean, they if the United States puts up a, uh, a tariff on uh, Chinese steel, you know, the Chinese were trying to develop their steel industry, and they did a fantastic job of building it. But they they were willing to subsidize exports, you know, so that they were, in effect, dumping uh, extra production on the rest of the world, um, uh, you know, which really would harm a U.S. steel producer. You know, it's it's not not a fair trade at all. Well, nobody does fair trade. You know, some some countries are uh, I don't know whether you'd call it sneakier or their methods of um, of having not have free trade. Like, how are they uh, doodling the uh, result in their favor? You know, the the French are really fantastic. At, uh, at cheating, you know, compared to the Brits are probably the least, uh, they're, they're, too tra they're too transparent or they're the most transparent. The, the United States is kind of in between. Uh, you know, if you use an example of a tariff that's, that's stupid, uh, but nevertheless um, uh, a big effect on the U.S. is... Um, is Canada is a large producer of of pulp paper and wood products, you know, and one of them is softwood lumber. Well, the United States always, even though in the free in the trade agreement between Canada and the U.S., they lay out the rules, and the rules would have no tariff on softwood lumber going from Canada to the U.S., but it never fails that you've got um, producers of lumber lobby Congress, and Congress imposes a, uh, a tariff on the uh, softwood lumber so that all of the housing in the United States costs more. All of the producers in, in the United States are able to get a higher price than, than they should for the lumber. And then every so often the the trade mechanism is settled and and the Canadian producers recoup the money that was otherwise sitting in the tariff pot. Um, it all it's sounds just, terribly it, irrational. 
just the way Trump's uh, you know tariffs on China found it irrational because in the end the American uh, the American industry the American consumer winds up paying the tariff. Yeah, he kept saying the Chinese were paying it, and that's just there's just idiot idiocy, and, or it's incorrect. It really is just cost. Well, um, uh, you know, you don't like free trade may be good economically. But economics isn't everything, you know. You know, if you want to have a strong military, you know, do you subsidize an air aircraft producer? You know, should you look after Boeing, you know, or Lockheed, you know, those kind of companies? Uh, you know, you've got these. Um, you know, why are the Leopard tanks better than the Abrams tanks? Maybe. You know, somebody may not think so, but, you know, the rest of the world seems obvious that the leopard tanks were the first pick for the Ukrainians. Um, the um, why, why should you have other things? Like, what do you think uh, is a good reason to not have free trade? Well, I'm... You know, maybe I'm being too liberal. My understanding is if you're a nationalist, you know, an isolationist, as a Republican in this country generally are, you oppose free trade um, and you want tariffs and you want to, you know, keep it all here at home in this kind of, uh, kind of international greed uh, modality. But if you're a liberal, you're open to free trade. And I guess that's where I would, that I would go. I would say, hey, let's just take all the tariffs down. Let's just let it, let it go. Let's be friends. Um, let's uh, allow investment easier. Let's allow the international, you know, solution of uh, legal problems, you know, disputes easier. Um, let's let's just not tax each other for that because it's so often it backfires. And let's let the world be one market. That would be my inclination. Am I wrong? Um, well, let, let's change that around and say, um, if you were a Canadian, would you trust the United States to play fair on everything that's traded back and forth? What's an example of not playing fair? Well, the lumber dispute I just gave you. Okay. Let, like, I, why I, I do would people... say we have to agree that there is no tariff. We have to agree that uh, what I manufacture goes into a free market and what you manufacture goes into a free market. And, and the natural market forces would adjust that. Um, and, and somehow we have to avoid the trickery, you know, and the not playing fair. Well, look, look you'd call cheating is a, is a nasty way to say it. But Biden currently... Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, with all of the uh, infrastructure spending, you know, is that he wanted a special Buy America side to that. Mm. Oh, so that, you know, the steel that might be produced, you know, there might be some specialty kind of steel that's being produced in Toronto or near Toronto, uh, uh, you know, in particular, a city called Hamilton produces a lot of really exotic, good steel products. Uh, you know, and the, you know those that industry developed in part based on market in Canada, the U.S., and elsewhere that Canada has trade agreements with. Well, suddenly, if if Biden says, "Well, gee, we want to have this uh, just uh, U.S. steel." Well, it's pretty disruptive. Like I call that, you know, it, it may make political sense to an American to say, let's cheat on the free trade. You know, and I'm using the word cheat because if you take your approach to why should we have free trade, and I would say as a uh, trained economist, that's really a good idea, Jay. You just figure out how we can implement it so nobody cheats, and it would be a wonderful, wonderful result for the world. <laughs> you know, but 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 I wouldn't trust. You know, you know, I trust the Americans more than the French, but 
but certainly would trust the French more than the Chinese. Well, suppose, suppose uh, I, mean, I, I know this is not likely to happen, but suppose it was an international body, you know, that said, um, okay, no, no cheating. Uh, when you know we, we're going to criticize you if you go isolationist, if you if you go tariff, uh, if you say buy American, which is actually silly. You know, footnote to that is uh, he was stopping imports of steel uh, or ta- uh, you know putting tariffs on them, and then he found that his infrastructure bill could not be implemented because the steel was too expensive, and and there was no steel. This is in the paper a couple of weeks ago. Poor guy, you know, he wants infrastructure. But he also wants buy American. Well, the Americans aren't producing enough steel, so there is no steel. Great job, Joe. Um, and so, I mean, to me, there has to be a an agreement, sort of a global agreement, and b maybe the United Nations or some organization that looks over the whole world and says, "Don't cheat. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna criticize you if you cheat." And maybe worse, maybe some kind of sanction if you cheat, because the cheating is public. You know what? What the Chinese are doing, we know what the French are doing, we know what the US is doing with isolationism, we know. Um, so if you say that's not permitted, if you have some global organization that says that's not permitted, don't aren't you able to cut out all the cheating? You could in theory, but are you giving up um, other objectives? You know, a nation has other objectives rather than simply the maximum gross domestic product that can be produced every day. You know, the United States uh, uh, totes its horn every day of the week saying we're the most powerful military in the world. You know, others might say, well, almost. The Chinese are pretty close, are getting there. Um, But is that a good objective? And well, it is uh, look, look at the Chinese for a moment. Look at the Chinese. You know, they, they're doing their stand-up thing. Uh, they're producing steel. They're producing all kinds of stuff, and, and especially including, you know, high-tech stuff. Uh, they're doing everything they can to dominate markets, all markets, every market. Um, and, you know, so that if every country, um, you know, produced as much cans of vegetables and as much cans of fruits as it possibly could, that if it it it, it, it became efficient, that it's, it's the system of economics was efficient, and that everybody produced, there was no slack there, wouldn't that be a better world? We wouldn't, wouldn't we have a global domestic, well, not a domestic product, a global product that was way higher than what we have now? There would be. Uh, however, let, let's use an example with um, uh, um, countries with a population that has wealth. They're in charge of the world trade now. You know, the United States, you know, Western Europe dominate that scene. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, is Every country that produces raw material, such as Canada, produces a bunch of oil. Well, why do they not refine the oil in, you know, in Alberta, like Edmonton, and then they send the finished products to the right place? Well, the United States says, no, 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 we want we want the jobs for refining. So the end result of of the the market or the population with the money, they're in charge. You know, the United States basically says, no, 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 we want to buy um, the heavy oil from the Alberta oil sands at $20 a barrel discount, refine you know, the Koch brothers have one refinery in Minneapolis that has about half a million barrels a day that they refine with this $20 discount. You know, like, like a lot of millions of dollars every day. Um, and, you know, the out of their 
oil out of their refinery is gasoline, and the gasoline is no different in price whatsoever. You know, so American policy, you know, with a little lobbying effort or whatever, is uh, we're not going to buy, you know, gasoline. We 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 want to buy the crude and do the refining. You know, we want to buy the wheat and make the cereal. We want to buy the you know, raw material. We want to buy your copper and make the wire. We want to buy your iron ore and your coal and make steel. You know, we want to do the manufacturing. You know, like that, you know, the Chinese, you know, much like the U.S., they're, they're a large country, but they got a humongous population. Well, even though a few years ago their their average GDP per person was less, when you've got enough people, even a small GDP gives you a lot of buying power, and eventually, you know, they they develop all of these industries. But um, you know, the the difficulty with any concept of free trade is really that uh, you know there are other objectives objectives that governments have it's politically not expedient is is that it is you know in theory wonderful to have free trade worldwide but you could never get around the political cheating well and i think you know you talked about the domestic considerations involving you know labor and and um you know the capital ownership and so forth um but um we should throw in the notion of geopolitical consideration um, you know, for example, we're in competition with China. It's not just political. We are, in fact, in competition with them. And um, I guess the concept would be, and I'd like your thought about this, the concept would be is if we, if we let our guard down, if we don't compete with them, uh, we lose at some fundamental level. So we must compete and we must be, to some extent, um, you know, protective. Yeah, but you don't, the United States doesn't compete fairly. You know, so why? How could you expect anybody else to? I mean, the the United States is really a a big bully. You know, and and you know, if you just think of all of the trade that Canada does with the U.S. or Mexico does with the U.S., you know, in both cases, if you just stood back a little bit, the U.S. has bullied all of that in its favor. You know, the, the oil example or, you know, the steel that, you know, they want raw material, raw products to come from Mexico and Canada and, you know, every, everything that's of any value to be done in the U.S. Well, what, what about the investment side of it? You know, my reading suggests that free trade also involves the easy flow of investment money across borders. And that's therefore, correct. so so if, um, you know, Mexico wanted to, you know, level the playing field and Mexico would try to attract capital and, and, and build these, um, you know, these factories, whatever. The same thing with Canada. Um, so and if I was on Wall Street and Mexico was offering me, a, you know, some kind of better arrangement, a more attractive arrangement as a, an investment target, I might very well write them a check. And if I write them a check and they, ma and they make a factory, then you're kind of even evening the playing field. And so the Koch brothers, uh, you know, sure, they got this big refinery, but maybe there's a big refinery across the border and so forth. Um, so can't, can't this be leveled the, through the, the magic of international investment? Well, there are a lot of leveling mechanisms uh, that exist. Uh, you know, for example, the growth of China was not because the United States government or the British or French government or Japanese governments decided, wouldn't it be nice for China to develop a phenomenal bunch of industries? You had a whole bunch of corporations who were making their decisions independent of or despite the government of the country they were in. You know, Shell Oil, in theory, is you know headquartered in Holland. Well, they don't give a hoot what the Dutch government has to say. You know, where, where you know, Chevron or, or Exxon, you know, they have to heed a little bit what the U.S. says, but really, really not 
you know, the Exxon, for example, was was key to the, Russia's ability to produce oil and gas. I mean, the Russian technology was non-existent, and and most countries and most companies wouldn't go there. Well, Exxon decided, well, they'll hold their hand and. And in theory, you know, it's worth the risk for the money they might make for Exxon. Well, you know, your corporations and, you know, let's call it the Wall Streets of the world, um, uh, you know, capital flows uh, not just because governments say do A, B or C. You know, now in China, the government's influence is much greater if you look at the way they've just stomped on Jack Ma and a bunch of the tech industry there, um, you know, they just said, you know, you can you can be wealthy, but you better be an obedient oligarch rather than an independent entrepreneur. Um, the, oh, you uh, know, all of this speaks of the of the human condition. You know, at the end of the day, I love to say at the end of the day, we're all mammals. And our societies are built on collections of mammals who sometimes, uh, you know, have noble ideas and sometimes not. So my question to you uh, is that is the, the description you give, you know, of free trade as being imperfect, as being subject to cheating and, um, you know, and and and, and uh, other governmental interests, yeah, other governmental. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and for that matter, geopolitics in the human condition can. Is it always going to be like this? Does my utopian world of liberal trade everywhere, you know, sort of an altruistic view, it's okay to let the other guy uh, can his vegetables, that's okay. Um, what, is, what is the long-term view? What do you feel this is all going to evolve to? Are we ever going to get to a place where there is global free trade? Well, I think we will inch closer and closer and closer to it. But a, a good example of of, um, of the kind of impediments that that make it really arduous to get there is think of Joe Manchin and the production of coal to to use to produce electricity in West Virginia, or their coal production to produce electricity everywhere. And because of his political clout, the U.S. It does the wrong thing. You know, yes. Now, yes. for Manchin's political career, it was probably the right thing, you know, for him, but not certainly not for everybody else. And, and because you have people like he's not the most powerful person in the United States, but you don't need to be to have, you know, above your weight influence. Like, you know, that and now it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, uh, people acting in their own personal vested interests, what's good for them and their family and their pocketbook and their, you know, brother and sister and next door neighbor or whoever's in their friendly list, um, you know, they're going to act in that interest. And, 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 you know, unless there's some way to control that, like if you take a simple concept of monopolies, um, you know, you get a, a fairly small growing city and, and you get the, uh, you set up a, um, a company where you get sand, gravel, and you bring in, you know, lime and whatever else you need to make concrete. You know, you get a cement factory. So you've got the only ready mix um, business in this city. Now, as long as you've got some volume, nobody else could ever afford to set up and get in there. Now, you've got a monopoly and you're going to stand in your head and protect that. You know, you're going to make sure you're, you know, you can charge a little extra because the the nearest place is 25 miles away. And if they're going to have a ready mix concrete truck driving 25 miles, well, that's, 
you know, that's at least your cushion in what you're pricing. And it doesn't matter what product it is, um, uh, like basic economic theory kind of says everybody acting in their um, self-interest is doing the most they can for their the society in which they live. You know, and then you have to bring in the but, you know, like, except when you get to where you have restrictions on the trade, any restrictions at all, you know, and monopolies, for example, are one. Well, what is the world doing about uh, Amazon? What are they doing about Microsoft? What are they doing about, you know, are those monopolies or quasi monopolies? How come, you know, every, you know, maybe once a week, every gas station in the city changes the price exactly the same amount, exactly the same way every, you know, at the same time. Yeah, what a coincidence. You know, well, and and now, why has that never been treated as a monopoly? Why, you know, there, you know, there's a governmental will or a need, you know, to control that or to prevent it. So, so what you have is, as long as you can get away with cheating, whether it's on your income tax or, you know, a bunch of oil companies uh, somehow having the price change. Now, you know, you might be a good investigator and you can't find that there was no place in, in New York City or Chicago where all of the oil executives met and they decided on the price that day and clicked the next day, it showed up at all the gas pumps. You know, there was no collusion method. They, they had good ways to get around having a meeting that violated a criminal collusion. Yeah, well, and <laughs> the government it's... the government is weak. It doesn't do anything about that. It doesn't make the case. When's the last time you saw a, a major case on price fixing? Well... Okay, but you really come down to free trade, you know, whether it, you don't even have free trade within the United States. Yeah. So I, it's just, this leads me to, you know, kind of a futuristic look for a moment. And that is, you know, the Joe Manchin problem could be fixed. He has too much power. Um, the, the American government is like uh, stuck in, in the original Constitution without, without dynamics, without a Supreme Court that understands what's happening on the beach um, without a Congress that, that addresses these problems and develops public policy to meet the times. So this country uh, wouldn't have these um, unfair, unfair leverages of power if the government were reformed to be a modern and sensitive to the society in which we live. And, and I would take that to a global level. If we had a United Nations, okay, which was powerful and independent of the problems like the veto in the Security Council and all that, and it could make rules of the same sort to level the playing field on a global basis, we could deal with this. I know it's a long way from here to there, but isn't is a very, very, very long way? But but isn't that the ideal? Well. You know that I'm an idealist and and that I would, you know, can't resist but saying, of course, that's true. But um, how you get from here to there is an impossible task in my mind, just because of the nature of people. And, and you know, why do you have different countries? Like in Canada, we don't even have free trade between our provinces. Like, like the U.S. has some, you know, interstate restrictions, but Canada's got some terrific ones. <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I would I would expect there's, uh, you know, more free trade between British Columbia and Washington State than there is between British Columbia and <laughs> Quebec. You know, picking another <laughs> province in Canada that's got more restrictions than any. This takes us back to the fundamental problem 
the fundamental problem of politics and economics uh, of, of human society, and I articulated it early in this program, and it is the fact that we are all biochemical mammals <laughs> interested <laughs> in our own welfare and our own interests first, and I don't know how we fix that. Well, economic theory, you know, really starts with that idea that, you know, if you act in your best self-interest, you will actually do the most for everybody around you. You know, and, and you know, that that you can just sort of stop there and that's correct until you get, you know, restrictions or impediments. And those, most of those are put in by government. And you know, right. some monopolistic, you know, limitations on what anybody else can do. And then, and then there are winners and losers, and uh, it, it's it's not it's not a uh, uh, an even playing field. But well, and also though, when you have the most powerful, you know, if you're saying the United States is in in most regards the most powerful country in the world, well, as long as they have set all the rules that keep, they're going to keep it that way. You know, like like the U.S. is is a bully in terms of all economic treatment of everybody else. Well, um, you know, and, and most Americans, take, you know, think that hurts. You know, I lived in in the, the United States uh, for several years, two stints, uh, one in New York City where I was too young to know too much. And then I lived in Salt Lake City for quite a while. And uh, if I told that to you know, people that I worked with in Salt Lake City, they'd think I was a nut. They think, you know, <laughs> every Canadian th thinks we're wonderful, you know, liberal, open-minded, fair-playing guys. I mean, <laughs> gee, the American economy is just a nice, fair thing, you know. If you work hard, you get ahead. Well, subject to, you know, those with more power than you have. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully there's another generation coming up. It's a generation maybe like you and me uh, that sees this in, in liberal terms. Um, but we should we should continue to follow it because I think there are examples coming up where we can we can show that there uh, that that would be more ideal than what we have now. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that the generations coming on are have, have that slant at all. You know, is is I think that that there is, you know, why we have so much social unrest, and you know, at the bottom end of the bucket, all the people living on the street is because uh, people have said the game is not fair. You know, is is look at the push in you know, DeSantis in particular doing that. Uh, you know, so the United States, um, if we can't have uh, uh, outright discrimination. Well, let's let's um, eliminate the biggest leveler. Uh, you know, education. Let's have all public schools be second class. And you know, if you can afford to send your kid to a private school, then he'll succeed. And if not, uh, you know, the public school wouldn't work. It. I mean, if if you and I had not been able to go to a public school that was as good as any um, private school, uh, we would never have, you know, done any, uh, you know, succeeded with anything in our life. I mean, education's the big leveler. Okay, we got to go, Ken. <laughs> Ken Rogers, Dr. Ken Rogers, a PhD in business and finance from the GBA Graduate School of Business in Wall Street, and uh, now known as the Stern School. Uh, thank you so much, Ken. It's great to talk to you about this. We'll with follow my, up with my unbiased opinions. <laughs> and, and mine, and mine. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.